Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Welcome to this special edition of the Urban Agenda. Recently, Schools Chancellor Joel Klein joined us at the Community Service Society to speak about his first year heading the newly created New York City Department of Education. On this special edition of the Urban Agenda, Chancellor Klein also answered questions from New Yorkers who gathered to hear him speak at a CSS forum. The Chancellor began by declaring that public education is the single most important domestic issue facing the United States today an opinion shared by many New Yorkers, and then turned to his work during the past year. And I want to just touch on why I think the first year, by no means a flawless year, has nevertheless been a terrifically good year in terms of essentially a few core initiatives that are designed not just to be program-based changes, but to really start to change the culture. And you'll hear me talk a lot more about this as we go forward in the years ahead. But the first thing I want to mention is we restructured this district organization from 40 districts to essentially 10 regions with an intense focus on instruction. So for the first time, we have a local instructional superintendent that's now addressing 10 or so schools in close collaboration with principals and coaches, as I'll come back to in a second. We restructured in a way that makes operations and youth support, which are critical, these support functions supporting the fundamental instructional function. And we did this, mind you, by saving $140 million out of the district budgets, $140 million that is now money in the schools, which otherwise would have been in the districts, and an additional $110 million at Essential, a quarter of a billion dollars and that money can be one place or the other. I, I, like everyone, think we need more resources. I think the fiscal equity suit should get us more resources. But when you have a fixed budget in any given year, the money can either be what I call north of the school, at the district, regional, essential level, or at the school. That transformation of almost 30% of the resources north of the school to the school, I suggest to you, is critical. Second thing that we implemented in addition to a major restructuring we implemented a core curriculum with coaches in the school building with 8 million new materials. So for the first time, for example, here in Manhattan, we've got kids north of the park, south of the park, east of the park, and west of the park working off the same curriculum. It's a rigorous curriculum. I think it's a demanding curriculum, and I think it has the right tools in terms of the mixture of teaching components that a kid will need from a very rigorous basic phonics program appropriate to some kids to a much more expansive classroom library pro uh, program appropriate to others and a mix in between. Same kind of approach to math. The ability to do effective professional development, which we're making massive investments in, unprecedented investments, is made that much easier by working off the same page. And I understand the argument that not everybody can one curriculum doesn't fit all, but what I know from the past is we had lots of different curriculum in many instances not working for many of our kids. The number of kids who are dropping out, being pushed out, or failing out of our schools in high school is an extraordinarily high number. And so the argument that we should just allow, allow a thousand flowers to bloom, I don't think has credibility. I think we need to be on one page working together in professional development. Sure, it's going to be hard during any transitional year, but nevertheless, I think that will help us. In support of that, we've put in place these interim assessments, which are soft assessments, so we don't have to wait till the end of the year to see if a kid is getting it or not getting it. We're able to implement that much earlier and get a sense get a sense of what a teacher's strengths and weaknesses are so that working with our coaches and our principals we can support teachers in areas where they're strong some teachers are terrific at long division but not good at fractions or vice versa we need to have that information so that we can work with them some kids are good at one and not the other we don't need omnibus professional development so that everybody's doing the same thing we need to tailor our development 
to the strengths and weaknesses of the individuals in the system. And this approach, data-driven, soft assessments, I think will enable us to move forward, especially working now for the first time in most schools with real coaches, a local instructional superintendent. The next thing that we did is put a parent coordinator in every school, 1,200 of them. How many meetings have you been at in New York where people talk about you got to have more parent involvement, parents should be partners in their kids' education? Everybody talks about it. Until now, nobody has done anything significant about it. We've made an almost $50 million investment in parent coordinators. And frankly, there was some skepticism about it. But I am hearing on the ground from hundreds and hundreds of schools, PTAs, communities that are saying this is really working. And we're getting the kind of support in the school. Now, this is a program that we could expand if we find that it gets the fruits that it deserves, but for the first time, parents have got somebody inside a school building that person is there devoted to those parents. Fourth major initiative, a leadership academy. How critical is leadership to a school? If your goal is my goal, to have several 1,200 schools that all of us would be proud to send our kids, we are going to need 1,200 great school leaders. And I don't take the view that school leadership is just another step in the hierarchy. I think it is a critical role, and we need to invest in it, just as any business invests in its core leadership. And I'm proud to say that we've been able to raise over $50 million already out of $75 million that we're going to seek in the private sector in order to support leadership training throughout the city. No school district has ever done it in this way, in this scale. We started with 90 aspiring principals in a 15-month program. Those principals are currently in training now. It's an intense training program, and they are principals who I think are going to be willing to take up the challenge to work in our toughest schools and turn schools around. I think they're getting the training, and I think they have the willpower. Why would business and foundations invest $75 million if they didn't understand something that I think for too long hasn't been understood in public education. School leadership is a critical variable. Obviously, teachers matter because teachers teach our kids. But a school leader can create a teaching and learning environment inside a building that can be supportive of teachers, that can be supportive of students, that can actually take people to new and different levels. What leadership is about is finding a spot in somebody that they didn't know was there and allowing them to own that spot so that they can help others find spots inside of themselves. And we are making a massive investment in leadership as well. So those are four critical levers for change that we built into the system this year. Are there going to be bumps? Of course there's going to be bumps. Is there overcrowding? There's been overcrowding in New York City public schools long before I got here. God willing, it won't be long after I leave. But that is a problem that we need to address. You're watching a special edition of the Urban Agenda. Next, Schools Chancellor Joel Klein answers questions from those gathered at our CSS issue forum. Are your kids getting enough art? Whether through poetry, dance, music, or drama, the arts open the doors to creativity. As a mother and teacher, I know that arts education can help our children develop confidence and a better understanding of the world around them. Even if you have just 30 minutes a week, get your kids more involved in the arts. And think about the kind of world we can leave behind for our children and our children's children. Art. Ask for more. AmericansfortheArts.org. Schools Chancellor Joel Klein joins us for this special edition of the Urban Agenda as New Yorkers who gathered at a CSS issue forum posed questions. I'd like to ask you about an aspect of implementing No Child Left Behind. And I'd be interested to hear, as you look back over the year, what that, what that means, centralization of No Child Left Behind implementation. And also, from a practical standpoint for a parent, is there a phone number, a citywide hotline type number where a parent can call and say, my, the middle school my child's supposed to go to is, is not up to par, I'm really worried, what are my options, what can I do? 
Sure. Okay. Thank the, you. The easy answer to, to, to the last question you asked is 311 as well as the Chancellor's hotline. Both of those are numbers that any parent can call. Now, I know Child Left Behind, for example, just so you want to know what centralization meant. First thing it meant was you weren't limited to your own district. So for some districts in New York, for example, if you're in District 5 in Harlem, I heard from a lot of parents being allowed to transfer within District 5 is not a satisfactory solution. So we opened it up citywide. Second thing we did, we gave each parent up to eight choices. And the trick was to try not to flood any particular school while we try to respect parental choice at the same time. So in that process, for example, the first year of No Child Left Behind, I think something like about 1,400 people transferred. This year, over 8,000 transferred. And virtually without exception, they all got one of their top three choices. Now, a lot of, particularly in the lower grades, a lot of parents don't want to transfer their kids out because their transportation and other issues. But through centralization, we were able to do this through a computer run, basically, to match of uh, people up. The other thing we're able to do is to make sure that no particular school got 200 while another school only got 20 because that would impose an unfair burden on that school. It's been a challenge. I will tell you, New York's the only city that has transferred anywhere near that magnitude of students under no child left behind. Other cities have either just refused to do it or have decided that uh, they'll do something differently. So it's, again, like all stories, it's not an unalloyed success story, but it's been a pretty good story for us. I'll, I'll ask one from the, the chair's perception. Um, there was a, a, actually a middle page article mentioning the fact that there's a step back from the new region standards uh, that came out in math uh, with some sort of vague dis discussion saying that there were major mistakes in the math regions but it looks like there's a step away from that e entire effort. What is your take on this and what is your position? Uh, my, my take is the following. I think that standards and tests are a way to inject accountability and for too long I have been afraid that the system will make excuses and I think therefore even though uh, I don't think tests are a perfect indicator I think some real ability to measure and have accountability in the system is critical, particularly in those areas where public education has not been working well. And look, for guys like me, it would be much easier if you didn't have things like No Child Left Behind. They put pressure on the system, but the system needs pressure because it's often the voiceless who gets shortchanged in a system like ours. So as much as I would like my own life to be easier, I think the pressures are good. Having said that, these are, are systems that are imperfect. I always like to make the analogy, I don't think a test is like a thermometer. I don't think each year you're going to get 98.6 when you measure each person's temperature who is normal. And so some years you make the test too hard, some years you make the test too easy, but over time there are comparative ways to look at how you're doing that are important. So I think what the state did was basically New York has probably been the most rigorous, or probably one or two or three in any event, most rigorous in terms of standards, testing, and so forth. And I think they realized that maybe they had driven the car too fast. So they're going to take their foot off the gas for a while. But that doesn't mean they're going to change direction. And I think that you know by slowing down for a couple of years, and enabling people to catch up a little bit, take some pressure off the system, may actually be salutary. If they were to reverse course, I would be the first one out there screaming that that's the wrong direction to take. I don't want an excuse-based culture in our system. My name is April Parks. I'm a parent advocate. I'm also a CPAC member and District 11's Title I rep. The question I have is when you talked about youth development, and in many different community-based organizations and things that you can have come into the schools, what happens is a lot of your principals reject the help. And I know because I'm there, and I know a lot of schools that have done it. There's a lot of different things that we could talk about intervention and prevention, and that's the main part of the educational system. And we work with intervention and prevention, not wait till something happens and then figure out how to fix it so it don't happen again. We should fix it before it happens. Why can't you use that as part of your intervention and prevention, where those community-based organizations can actually come into those rooms and work with conflict resolution with the children, work with different means of 
how to be a positive person in your society. That we are not doing with our children, and that is affecting the classroom, and the teachers cannot handle all of that themselves, and the parents sometimes can't handle it also, because society is the one that is doing it. Yes, the parents do have to work double hours, two different jobs, three different jobs, and everybody know it. Sometimes we don't have the time. That does not make us a bad parent. That makes us a parent that knows that we're responsible to keep a roof over their head, to make sure they have clothing and so they actually can go to school and get an education. And the other thing I just need to ask, collaboration with the Department of Education as a whole. When you do some professional development, especially with your parent coordinators, you need to do it with all three of us in the room at the same time. Your parent coordinator, your PTA president, and your principal needs to have professional development together. All right. So how are you going to answer this one? Well, let me, let, me answer, let me answer it this way. Let me, on the first point, I fundamentally agree with the point that was made. And one of the reasons I did the restructuring is to develop a separate line on youth development and support and community support. I brought in Lester Young from District 13, who I think everybody said 13 was a model for this kind of community-based support. And I've asked him to basically take it to the whole city. One of the things that I think was going wrong is youth development was being looked at not in terms of community, but in terms of school. And I don't think you can look at youth development in terms of school. You've got to look at it in terms of community. So I don't know the specifics about what schools are rejecting what opportunities, but I've told Lester Young to make sure two things, that we don't have any contracts with anybody because it's good for the party we contract with. It's got to be good for the community and good for the school. And second of all, most youth development off efforts really ought to be tied very closely to the community because it's a community support issue. And we need to target different communities in different ways. There are different issues that we face in certain communities than we do in others, and we under need to understand how basically we can triage those functions. On the parent coordinators and, and the PTAs, uh, I would say that that's still a work in progress. I would say it's going better than some people say not as good as we would ultimately like it. I have had heard from a number of PTA presidents who are quite happy. We're going to start now training with the PTA presidents. When you make a transformation like this, you would like to do everything all at once. I've been accused of doing too much too soon. Now, uh, sometimes we have to do things a little more slowly than I would like. Uh, but I do agree we need to get appropriate alignment of the principal, the PTA, uh, and the parent coordinator. Um, Another state, statewide issue, which is the governor has uh, appointed a commission, which apparently has left your department out. Is there any further discussion going on? This is in reaction to the CFE case uh, to try to get equalization of, of, of funding, and we think we'd be a prime participant in this. What well, happened here? Well, I think I, I think that you'd have to ask the governor, but, <laughs> but I think but I think in reality, again. Yes, we'll, we'll talk to you about that. We have a card on that. But here is what I think. Here's, again, this case has been going on for a decade. If you look at the funding flow from Albany to the city, compare it, for example, to other major cities. I'm not just compare it to Buffalo or, or to Rochester or to Syracuse, and you see the funding flow to New York has been far short in terms, I mean, we're talking about $2,500 uh, a kid in, in comparison to many of these things. This case has been going on for 10 years. What we need now is a political solution. The court has been clear about it. So instead, what we're getting is another commission. We're going to look at all the standards and all the other things. And you know, these are issues that have been studied to death. And I think that the solution that is required here is really a compensatory remedy that addresses both our capital needs and our teacher needs. I mean, everybody here is talking about those issues. I mean, I, I think uh, certainly we don't invest nearly enough in getting high quality math teachers into the system, which is critical to what we're trying to do if we're going to train people. So instead, we're going to have another commission, and then the commission is going to have another discussion, and the anti commission will attack the commission, and like all the other yeah. things in education. What I would like to see is a political solution, a multi year commitment to our city to give us the capital and operating that the Court of Appeals said. And to get that started, instead of political gridlock and study, at some point, I think that these issues are not going to benefit from further study. They're going to really require real political will and leadership. So that's been my biggest problem, because the governor's commission won't even report until March. The executive budget is due in January. I, I'm wondering, in, in this regard, 
is Mayor Bloomberg willing to make this a focus and a campaign? I mean, we have not heard the kind of intense political activity coming from the mayor's office on this issue yet. Well, you just heard it from the mayor's chancellor. Okay. <laughs> we'll take that. I'll come back to Hi, my name is Barbara Rossi, and I am a public school teacher. This is my ninth year. I actually started in Long Island City in Astoria, right near Bryan High School. I used to sub, and they wouldn't let me in because I looked too young back then. Um, I just want to say how nice it is to finally meet the boss. I tell my third grade children that um, I'm the boss of the classroom, and the principal is the boss of the school, and the chancellor is the god of the schools. <laughs> so it's so nice to meet the god of the schools. <laughs> um, what I want to talk about a little bit and ask you a little bit about is the question before that was asked about how do you retain quality teachers in the classroom? And I was a little dissatisfied with your answer. I think that um, it is about good leadership because I've worked under six different principals and I've moved in four different schools because I refuse to work under a poor leader. So leadership is definitely a nugget, but you have to have good teachers in all your classrooms and you can't retain good teachers if they're not treated with respect. Um, do you know what my yearly budget is for my classroom? <clears throat> I'm given $200, and that $200 was in jeopardy this summer. I actually bought some things, and I heard, oh, it might not be there. $200. Do I get to buy my furniture? Do I get to buy my books? Do I get to buy anything in my classroom? No, I don't. I get the $200, and maybe the average teacher spends $400 of her own money. That's the average. So you have to keep, you have to give teachers materials, and that's the way that you encourage them to create exciting curriculum. If they have no control over their curriculum, if they have no control over the materials, why come to work? Why, if I can't go to a Barnes and Noble and get the latest book, wh what's going to excite me? What's going to keep me fresh? And I'm surrounded by teachers who have gone to Harvard and Brown, but I see the burnout in myself, and I see the burnout in teachers around me. So it's about getting resources to teachers, something like Teacher's Choice. How can parents help? By supporting your teachers. Giving them a Barnes and Noble gift certificate is a small way. Helping get assistant teachers in classrooms so that you can um, meet the needs of a lot of special needs. The other thing that's very important that I haven't heard this evening is small class size, and I know that's a real big political nugget right now because of the money behind it, but I will tell you that this year I have 23 third graders, and when I had 28 third graders, I didn't really enjoy my job as much. I didn't really get to do the exciting curriculum. I didn't get to hear my kids' voices as much as I can now. And so I can track myself and say, oh, this year's going better for me. Why is it going better? Although all the research is very controversial. Well, class size really, maybe it doesn't really matter. I don't know who's doing the research, because if you check with teachers, class size matters. It matters, and it matters, and it matters. So, so I hope that people in here are voting and are supporting small class size. I hope that you're supporting resources for teachers. I hope that you're supporting sabbaticals, because after nine years, I would like to learn. I would like to go and travel the world or learn a different way so that I can come back and become fresh for my kids instead of old and burn out. So I think sabbaticals, small class size, teacher's choice, increasing it to more than $200. I think I'd like to have more than a $200 budget. And I think also that you need to have good leaders because you can't have good teachers if you don't have good leaders. And last, I think you need help with teach kids with special needs. I think New York is a very, very hard place. And I'd like to meet the needs of my students. But if there are students that are so struggling, I, I, I have to almost turn them off. I can't meet their needs. And if I have large class size and not support with my kids with special needs, then I can't do the job that I need to do. So I think you're doing good work. I think you have a strong vision. And I'm here to support you. Just um, support me. Thank you. Well, that, that was very, very well done. So I, I, don't think, I don't think that necessarily calls uh, for an answer. The one, the one thing I will assure you, though, is uh, my wife and daughter uh, make sure every day that nobody in uh, my family mistakes me with any gods. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I think one of the things about being school chancellor in New York is a very healthy dose of humility. And I'll give you just a small example, because you're right about the 200 bucks. You're right about the lack of resources. You're right about all these issues of class size. But I don't control the budget. And I have got to educate 1.1 million people with the dollars they give me. And I've got to count on people like you doing heroic things. And the reason that many teachers do is because the greatest reward in life is to turn around a kid. And that keeps people in the game. And it happens in spite of all the odds. 
unfortunately, not everybody has the same attitude about the situation, and then we get into some of the problems. And that's true in terms of school leadership. It's true in terms of some teachers who I think probably feel at this point they're just punching a card. And that's a dreadful way to be involved. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to your kids. But I keep asking people, tell me where I should cut money. Because I have myriad places where I need to spend more money, teacher's choice being absolutely one. My thanks to Joel Klein, Chancellor of the New York City Department of Education. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society, and thank you for watching this special edition of The Urban Agenda. about the work of the Community Service Society of New York or to comment on the urban agenda, please contact us at 212-614-5425 and on the web at www.cssny.org.